What's a director trying to say when he abruptly jumps into flashbacks without giving any hint that they're coming? Kenneth Lonergan's Manchester by the Sea liberally uses these unannounced flashbacks. It opens with one, with Casey Affleck's Lee Chandler and his nephew, the young Patrick, engaging in playful banter on a boat. Back in the present, when Lee takes the elevator down to see the body of his brother Joe, we flash back to the time when Joe was first diagnosed with a heart condition. By setting the two scenes in the same building but years apart, Lonergan makes us wonder for a moment if we've misunderstood to think that Joe's died. Lee is going down in the elevator, and then he's in a hospital room with the still alive Joe. Then we notice that the doctor, Dr. Bethany, was referenced in the earlier scene as being on maternity leave. Oh, she's on maternity leave. And when we return back to the elevator, we understand clearly that we've just seen a flashback. Later, as Lee is faced with the prospect of becoming a guardian, Well, I can't be his guardian. We cut back and forth between this scene and the most crucial unannounced flashback, giving us a window into the pain inside Lee's mind and explaining why he feels unequipped to father Patrick, despite his evident love for the boy. All this brings us to the question, why does Lonergan keep us on our toes by making us decipher where each scene fits in the timeline? To answer this question, it's helpful to look back in film history and see how flashbacks have been done in the past, how they're usually done in the present, and the different roles they can play in a narrative. The director usually credited with first using flashbacks is D.W. Griffith. Griffith referred to them as switchbacks, but the flashback remained a rarely used technique in the 20s. Audiences weren't used to seeing flashbacks, so they needed a long, clumsy, or unnatural explanation to understand what was going on. A writer in 1921 called the flashback a, quote, murderous assault on the imagination. By the late 30s and early 40s, the flashback became less experimental and more standard fare in Hollywood. William Wyler's 1939 film Wuthering Heights, like the novel, is mostly told through flashbacks via Ellen the Housekeeper. In 1941's Citizen Kane, Orson Welles uses flashbacks creatively, framing Kane's life retrospectively through different points of view to reflect on the enigmatic protagonist. And in 1942, Michael Curtiz's Casablanca seamlessly flashes back to Paris to explain the lover's backstory, without confusing its audience in the slightest. In all these classic cases, flashbacks don't come out of the blue. In Wuthering Heights, the camera tracks out from the narrator to introduce the story of Heathcliff and Kathy. In Citizen Kane, the flashback begins with a sequence of a track in from behind, an extreme close-up of the words the reporter is reading, and a cross dissolve to the childhood scene in the snow. In Casablanca, the camera tracks in on Rick as he sits alone, and the picture blurs before cross dissolving into his Paris memories. 1944's Double Indemnity, told through multiple flashbacks, focuses on a narrator talking into a dictaphone and uses cross-dissolves as the means of transition. 1950's Sunset Boulevard, told by a dead man in a pool, begins with a cross-dissolve as well. All of these examples use clear visual means to announce the flashback and to bookend our journey back to the past. While a really obvious zoom or dissolve might look gimmicky in a flashback today, a lot of the visual announcement techniques in the 30s and 40s are still used today, in combination with some other developments. Brian Singer's The Usual Suspects in 1995 sticks to the old school in one scene where the camera tracks in on verbal, but it also goes with extreme close-ups, tinted and choppy sequences, and other techniques for the flashbacks that invariably follow verbal's narration just as if he were the noirish narrator of Double Indemnity or Sunset Boulevard. In The Born Identity, the flashback sequence literally flashes, cutting back and forth and also featuring jarring images. Pulp Fiction announces its non-linearity through title cards, so does 500 Days of Summer. Over time, film language has developed a variety of types of flashback, such as the testimonial or confessional flashback. Music. The conversational oh, flashback. Miracles happen every day. Some people don't think so, but they do. The object triggered flashback. The thought triggered flashback. A bow and arrow. And the filmmaker initiated flashback. Flashbacks can also have mixed or contradictory functions. The obvious function of many flashbacks is to provide exposition or backstory. But when the flashback only serves this purpose, it's often regarded as lazy and unimaginative storytelling. You're not making any sense. Not make it. Not make it. That's why Dad needs you, Joe Dernstein, and Nanamaker. Nanamaker.
Used more creatively, it can serve as point of view, either of the protagonist or of a variety of characters to show different sides of a story, or present competing views of a character or an event. Or flashbacks can also create the feeling of a puzzle, forcing the audience to piece together moments like detectives solving a mystery, so that we're invested in answering the deep questions of the story ourselves. Other films, like Manchester, choose to cut the effects and the middleman, namely the narrator, and go straight into flashbacks without announcing them. Alan Renee's 1959 film Hiroshima Mon Amour offers an early example of using unannounced flashbacks to mimic flashes of memory, suggesting how vividly past feelings persist in the present. 14 ans que je n'avais pas retrouvé le goût d'un amour impossible. Woody Allen's 1977 film Annie Hall flows freely between the past and present. Flashbacks can take place with no hint at all, as when Alvy reflects on how he first met Annie, or with lines that last a split second. You were very hot for Allison at first. Were you always funny? We had that argument just last month, but don't you remember that day? As Alvy states at the beginning, I keep sifting the pieces of the relationship through my mind and... And pieces are exactly how Alvy remembers Annie. As he reflects on what went wrong, time becomes of little relevance. Alvy can't get over his memories. Lonergan's flashbacks in Manchester give us total fluidity of time to represent a character who is tortured and imprisoned by his past. Just as for Alvy or Elle, Lee's memories intrude on his present and shape his ongoing life. So to set them off as finished or behind him would be misleading. The past isn't over for Lee. His past colors his present and makes life unbearable. The non-linearity mirrors the experience of grief for a heart that will never be unbroken. It's always gonna be broken. But I know yours is broken too. Also, far from being purely expositional, the flashbacks here are emotional. Each one presents an event of life-changing consequence to Lee. The flashback to Joe's first diagnosis is the beginning of his loss of his beloved brother, which from that point on is certain and only a matter of time. The flashback to Lee's great tragedy explains the thing that Lee can't shake off. I can't beat it. The reason he's terrified to be Patrick's guardian and why he won't involve himself in normal human interactions. The flashback to the happier days revolve around Joe's boat and joyful time spent on the water. In many films, water tends to be a symbol for emotional states, and a coastal area or beach can represent the place where our daily logical selves meet our emotional selves. When Lee looks out the window at the Manchester landscape and punches the window, he's grappling with his painful past, but he's also refusing to confront and accept his own emotions. He tells Randy, There's nothing there. There's nothing That's there. Not true. <laughs> That's <laughs> not, not true. There's nothing there. I'm serious. You don't understand. And I don't I'm know what to this... I know you understand. Because he views himself as dead inside, like the frosty winter ground that is evidently too cold for Joe to be buried in. But the happy flashbacks reminding Lee of the life he wishes he could go back to torture him the most, because while he would prefer to be dead inside, his emotions remain all too painfully strong. About halfway there, uh, I can't remember if I put a screen on the fireplace. I figure it's okay. The film's title and namesake, the town of Manchester by the Sea, Massachusetts, is Lee Chandler's dream and nightmare. He led a happy life there until the unspeakable tragedy, from which point on he's been fighting to leave it behind. Manchester is more than a place. To Lee, it's romance, it's fatherhood, and all forms of human connection, none of which Lee now feels capable of sustaining. Like some other flashbacks mentioned before, Lonergan's have an element of the puzzle or mystery too. As audiences work to stitch together Lee's timeline, the central mystery we're solving is the question of whether Lee has really changed or can change. The non-linearity plays into this mystery because it highlights Lee's own fear that he can never again recover, connect, or be responsible for another human being. Do you want to be his guardian? But like the winter that thaws into spring at the end of the film, Lee returns to the boat with Patrick in a final scene which echoes the very first. The mirrored framing suggests that Lee is finally thawing too, if only in small, limited steps, like looking for an extra bedroom so Patrick can stay with him overnight. Yeah, but I'm looking for one with an extra room. 
He's recognizing that some emotional life still exists in him and no longer denying his deepest self or his potential to feel again. I never cared much for moonlit skies. I never winked back at fireflies. But now that the stars are in your eyes, I...